All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in um, for our latest uh, Water Ambassador webinar. I think it's going to be a great presentation today. Um, and let me go ahead and get us all introduced here. Um, so we have uh, we're we're winding down into our our final lineup. Um, it, so today we're going to uh, hear from Missy Weiss from Orca about the One Health Fish monitoring uh, citizen science work that she's been doing. Uh, we have so uh, our remaining ones are on August fifteenth uh, from Aubrey Arrington of the Lakshahati River District. Um, we're trying. We're very close to lining up a September fifth speaker, so, so stay tuned for that. Uh, and September nineteenth, uh, we'll be hearing from Michelle Atkinson, Atkinson and Paul Monahan on working with HOAs on stormwater management. And also, please note on your calendars, we have a field trip lined up to visit the Lakshahatsi River District on September 26th, uh, I believe, and that is a Tuesday. So we're going to have the registration link coming out for that soon. So watch out for that. Um, and we've got a couple Loctahatchee River District talks this year, so um, this will sort of ties, tie all that together uh, with the talks that we've, we've heard so far. Also, to keep in mind, any of your uh, FNGLA members that are in attendance, you can apply for one uh, CEU, one unit, and uh, please contact Mary, Ms. Mary Mott uh, to get that CEU form. And, and you can reach out to me as well if you need to, uh, but, if, but Mary's got that form and she can have that for you to fill out and, and then get those units verified and, and awarded to you. So let's see. So we are uh, recording this. Um, again, we're gonna have this up on our YouTube channel that's shown here. The, um, move that uh, this out of the way for our live attendees. But yeah, if you Google, if you can copy this or even just Google UF IFAS extension Martin County on or search for on YouTube for UF ex extension, UF IFAS extension Martin County, you'll get to our channel or our um, YouTube channel and look for the 2023 Water Ambassador Program playlist. And we're slow. I'm slowly getting the previous years populated to almost done with 2022, um, and we're up to date with 2023. Um, for this today's recording, um, if you give me about a week or so to get that up, I'm, I'm going to be out of town for a few days, um, so it'll be a little bit of time before I can get that up. Um, so again, if you're not familiar, most of you are, please use the chat feature to ask your questions. You can ask them anytime. We will visit the chat um, at the end of um, Missy's presentation and, and go through the questions in order from there. Um, but, but feel free to ask it anytime you're, you're thinking of it, but we will address those questions after the presentation. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce um, Missy Weiss, from, she is the Director of Citizen Science and Education at ORCA, um, and she's been working there for, for several years now, and I first knew Missy from working with her on uh, a great program called A Day in the Life in the Indian River Lagoon, where we get kids out from schools on uh, one day in October to collect data uh, in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, and that's been running for several years now. And that's how I first met Missy and, and, and sort of began working with her and, and, and just so thankful that she's at ORCID running these kinds of these excellent programs for the public. Um, she's got her master's in marine science from Stony Brook University and her bachelor's from Southampton University as a, as a native New Yorker. And so we're so thankful that she's here down in Florida and uh, and running, uh, working with Orca, um, and she's going to talk to you about their a fairly recent project on Orca's effort to um, monitor fish as part of their One Health initiative, and she'll tell you a little bit more about that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Missy. I'm going to stop sharing mine, and let me see. 
Oh, there we go. Okay, whenever you're ready, Missy. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you all about our One Health Fish Monitoring Citizen Science Project at ORCA. Um, before I jump into the project, I just want to be able to go over a little bit about what ORCA is as an organization and who we are. Um, so let me try to progress my slide. Here we are. So ORCA is a nonprofit. We were founded in uh, 2005. Missy, I'm not actually seeing your slides. Oh, well, then there we have it. So let's start over. Okay. We're seeing your screen. We just need it in presentation. Perfect. Looks great. Okay, wonderful. Well, sorry about that, but as I was saying, I'm really excited to be able to share a little bit about this project to all of you and uh, hopefully inspire you to get involved. But before I do that, let me just review a little bit about ORCA as an organization, who we are, what we stand for. ORCA stands for the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. We were founded in 2005, as I mentioned, by Dr. Edie Witter. And our mission really is to protect and restore aquatic waterways and the species that those waterways sustain. And we do this in several ways. We do this through our innovative technology or our real-time water monitoring devices known as Kilroys. These devices are able to uh, take up quantities of water and monitor them and measure them on the spot for different environmental parameters. We also do this through our applied science research. Mm -hmm. So under that lens, we look mainly at uh, ecotoxicity as well as one health. And then we do our work through our education work, which is vital. So we are educating people of all ages, students, adults. We're constantly learning and um, we should be given that opportunity. So we'll go into schools, provide after school programs, summer programs. And more recently in 2019, we started our citizen science work. And so this is just engaging people in the community, again, people of all ages, backgrounds, ethnicities in the science research that we do here at ORCA. So we have four citizen science projects. Vincent alluded to one of them in his introduction. Um, one is the pollution mapping citizen science project. Another is a day in the life of the Indian River Lagoon. Again, that's really just a stepping stone for students to enter into the world of science research and citizen science. We do this through our One Health Fish Monitoring, which we'll talk about today. And our last citizen science project is our land to sea monitoring program. This is really our restoration work. It uh, encompasses a buffered shoreline initiative as well as a living shoreline initiative. But ORCA really is an applied science research organization. We look at the lagoon holistically and try to better understand those complex problems that are clearly plaguing its health. So today, what I really wanted to focus on, again, is our One Health Fish Monitoring Project. And so for those of you who are not familiar with the term One Health, it's really this idea that there is an interconnectedness between the environment's health, animal's health, and human health, and that there's a clear interface where the three of those entities combine or collide. And so under that umbrella, what we really look at is specific to fish. So we're looking at how there is a transfer of toxins and toxicants from the environment entering into the Indian River Lagoon and those freshwater waterways and potentially entering into the marine food chain. And specifically, we're looking at fish that have been identified as being commonly consumed or eaten by humans. And then what we do is we look for the potential human health risk, if any, of, for humans in consuming those fish. So the project really has multiple objectives. We're looking at one, well, what are the pollutants that they're making their way into the lagoon? Are those pollutants entering into the food chain, specifically in fish, again, that are commonly consumed? And what is the potential human health risk, again, if any, of consuming those fish? especially understanding that there are large populations of people all up and down the lagoon who rely on that fish for their primary protein source. And I'm really talking about subsistence fishing here. 
And so this project started in 2019, but it was instigated off of a pilot project that we conducted down in Martin County, really focusing in on subsistence fishers. And it was with that data that it really inspired this large scale project that is looking now at the entire lagoon. So at this time, we have been fortunate enough to receive over a thousand fish that we have that have been donated to us and then processed. Again, that's along all of the counties that border the lagoon. And of those fish, really what we're looking to test are two different biotoxins. So we look at something called microcystin, uh, commonly called um, provided by microcystis, that cyanobacteria or blue-green algae um, that has affected a lot of the southern lagoon. And then we also look at the biotoxin saxitoxin, which again is coming from a dinoflagellate up in the northern portion of the lagoon. We look at heavy metals. So in all of our samples of fish, we look at mercury concentrations. And then we have looked at subsamples of fish and specifically looked for lead and cadmium. We look at glyphosate, which is a common herbicide, which I'll talk about today in our fish fillets. We look for microplastics. Um, Coming this fall, we have a nice relationship with the University of Florida. And because we received a small grant from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program, we're able to test 100 fish for PFOS. And so that data will be coming this fall. And then lastly, I always like to put things out into the universe because you just never know, but um, we're really hoping to be able to add pharmaceuticals, phthalates, and we do have a relationship with Barry University to start looking at parasites in some of these uh, fillets as well, or these fish. So it's really meant to be a comprehensive list of analytes that we're continuously growing as more interest or funding or concern comes about. But this is what we're looking at presently in our samples. So none of this work would be done without the help of community volunteers or our citizen scientists. And this is one of those projects that seems to really um, lend itself to people wanting to get involved. And I think that's because there's a lot of ways that you can do that. And so we have over 150 volunteers that have worked on this project. Again, students, adults, um, grandparents working with their grandchildren. It really is open to anybody. And it's been, again, widely received. And I think, again, because people can understand it, there's a place for everyone to fit. And so in 2022, uh, nearly 2,000 hours were spent by volunteers in our lab working on this project. One way that people can get involved is by fishing for us. And so we have about 70 different fishers up and down the lagoon. We have about 125 individuals who will come into our lab here in Vero Beach and help us process those fish. And so that's just a fancy way of really saying dissecting or removing those important tissues and organs that we then analyze. We've trained nearly 30 people in the more sophisticated techniques where they're helping actually extract some of those toxins and toxicants from the samples. And then the last way that people can get involved is that they can start surveying. So a lot of the way that we better understand what fish people are eating or where they're eating and how much they're eating is through our surveys. And so we need individuals to go out into the community, go out to some of the popular boat ramp sites and just talk to some of the fishers and figure out what are you catching? How often are you fishing? How often are you eating those fish and whom are you, cons are you sharing that catch with? It's a really important part of that human health component of this project. And so my hope for today was just to kind of share a little bit of the data that was coming out of this project so far, again, to inspire you to participate or want to follow us along as we go through this journey. And so I'm going to start with um, where we are with fish collection. So this is a graph that is showing you how many fish we've received from the various counties. And so you can see along the X, we have the different counties and the Y is the quantity or the count of those total fish. And what is probably most obvious to you is that we need fish from Volusia County. We have one fish as well as Martin County. There's only 84. And the reason why we really need to bring those numbers up is so that we can start running some of our statistical analyses on these tests to start really digging into the science. So I'm encouraging you that if you happen to be a fisher in Martin County or even in St. Lucie County in Fallujah and you want to help, this would be one fabulous way that you could really help us along in this project. 
And so these are some of the fish that we're targeting. All of this information is on our website, so you certainly don't need to memorize it or, or you know, look at it right away, but just to kind of highlight some of the fish that have been identified as being fish that are consumed through our surveys. And so we've broken it up by saltwater or brackish water and those that are found in more of those freshwater ways that are you know, contributing to the lagoon. So I mentioned that I wanted to talk about some preliminary data. And so one of the toxicants that we are looking at is glyphosate. So glyphosate is the most commonly used herbicide worldwide. It's a multi-billion dollar business, and it's probably better known for being the active ingredient in Roundup. And there's a lot of contradictory information regarding glyphosate, how long it stays in the environment, does it, how long is its half-life, um, is it harmful to humans and biota, or is it not? And so some of that contradictory information is here. So according to the EPA, glyphosate is unlikely to be a human carcinogen. But according to the World Health Organization, it's said to be probably carcinogenic to humans. So again, there's a lot of contradictory information about it. But what we have found in Orca's work, at least, is that we know it's persistent. And it's persistent in both water as well as in our sediments. So across the board, in our large pollution mapping projects, in our pollution mapping citizen science work, as well as our day in the life of the Indian River Lagoon work, we're consistently finding glyphosate in water and sediment samples. So we know it, it, it's prevalent. The question really becomes, well, is there any biological effects? And so we wanted to ask that question relative to the One Health Fish Monitoring Project. So that's what we did. So essentially, we were able to get a Indian River Lagoon small grant to test about 100 fish for glyphosate. And so the way that volunteers get involved is, again, they catch and donate those fish, but then they also come into our lab and they help us homogenize or grind up that fish, as well as extract the glyphosate out of that sample, if any. And then ORCA staff will run an ELISA to determine the concentration of glyphosate, if any. So at this present time, we've been able to analyze 233 fish for glyphosate. Really the take home message from all of this, and I think it surprised us here too, is that every single one of those fish have had a positive concentration of glyphosate, no matter what county they were in or what species they were in. And that average of glyphosate runs to be about 0.33 parts per billion. And the range is, as you can see, from quite small 0.093 to 0.84 parts per billion. So the way that we take this information and we continue looking at it further is we looked at it according to county or by county. So once again, you'll have the county on the x-axis and you'll have the concentration of glyphosate and parts per billion on the y-axis. And so what we've done is we've pulled all of the fish that we've analyzed for glyphosate and we've determined their average concentration. And so what is really interesting is that no matter, it appears that at this time, and this is preliminary data, is that the average concentration is pretty similar, whether you're in Brevard County, Indian River, St. Lucie, or Martin. And then this is just all of the fish pooled together and the average concentration of those fish. Now, important to note, it's always good to highlight good science, is that our Martin County sample size is very small. So compared to our Brevard County, where we're looking at 103 different fish, Martin County, we've only analyzed 12 for glyphosate. So once again, it just kind of reiterates the importance of being able to obtain more of those fish from Martin County that have been identified as being highly consumed. But at this time, the mean concentration of glyphosate in fish fillets, they're all pretty close. So from this question, the next question that naturally developed was, well, are there differences in glyphosate by species? 
And so that's what we looked at next. And so I know that this figure is a bit overwhelming, but I just want to kind of walk you through it. So on the Y axis, you have the different species of fish. So you'll notice that there are several brackish water fish, but then there are also some freshwater fish like tilapia and, and cichlids. And so this is what we've been able to analyze for glyphosate at this point from the different waterways. And specifically, we're looking at fish where we had more than one specimen. So that's what you're looking at on the Y. On the X, again, you're looking at that average glyphosate concentration. And so we've kind of displayed it so that the higher concentrations are at the top and they work your way down to the lowest concentrations. And so, and then we wanted to kind of take this a step further and start color coding it by the diet of those fish. So anything that's green, so in this case, our striped mullet is an herbivore. It's only eating vegetation. The purple is an omnivore and the blue is a carnivore. Now I'm gonna be upfront and honest with you. I am not a fish biologist. And so I just did a quick search to determine their diet. So if any of you are and you say, well, I'm not really quite sure if an Atlantic croaker is only a carnivore, then please let me know. But we wanted to kind of see and dictate, well, are there any differences in the average concentration of glyphosate based off of diet? And so this is kind of the way that we're starting to tease out that data. Now to take this a step further, what we really want to be able to do is run some statistical analyses. And we couldn't do that with sample sizes as small as two or three, but we can do it for those samples that are larger than 10. And so that's the way that we are looking at it right now. So these are samples of fish. These are species of fish, again, on this axis here, where we have 10 or more of those specimens of each species that we were able to analyze for glyphosate. And then again, glyphosate is on the bottom. And so what we've been able to determine um, at this point through an ANOVA and a Tukey post hoc test is that black drum have significantly higher concentrations of glyphosate in their fillet compared to jacks, creval jacks, sheep's head, ladyfish, and hardhead catfish. So this is really kind of the interesting data that we're starting to be able to look at um, as far as our glyphosate data is concerned. And again, I, the point really is to get to the, the place where we have larger sample sizes so that we can be even more confident in our data. But we're really excited about this and, uh, and excited to start sharing it more. If I move on to our heavy metals, then um, I just wanted to kind of highlight two of them. So two of the heavy metals that we've been able to look at in our fish samples are cadmium and mercury. Now mercury is certainly one of those heavy metals that are consistently analyzed in fish tissues um, worldwide. I mean, that's why we have advisory levels already uh, established for those, unlike glyphosate. But um, I wanted to kind of share not just kind of the doom and gloom information, but some of the good stuff that comes out of this too. So for example, cadmium. Cadmium was historically used as in fertilizers for citrus groves. And so there was a question is, well, is that cadmium um, still staying in our environment? And if so, is it making its way into the Indian River Lagoon and into the marine food web into fish? And so again, we were lucky enough to receive an Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program small grant where we were able to look at 100 fish and analyze them for cadmium. The good news was that out of those 100 fish, only two of them came back with the detectable levels of cadmium, and those levels were of little concern. So that's the kind of information that you know we're, we're after. And so that's, a, in my eyes, a good thing that we are happy to share about. For mercury, this again is a heavy metal that is regularly tested in fish worldwide. There's established advisory levels and consumption guidelines. And it's often why you hear that people of certain demographics should avoid eating fish that have higher levels of mercury. So we have been able to test a little over 830 different fish for mercury. 99% um, of those fish have had a positive concentration of mercury. And I wanted to share some of that data with you now. So in this graph, what you're looking at, again, the same way I broke it down for glyphosate is uh, average mercury by county. So we have Brevard, Indian River, St. Lucie, and Martin. And then we have the concentration of 
uh, mercury on the Y. And so all I really want you to focus on at this moment in time is the blue bars, because that's showing you all of our mercury data since 2023. And so um, from this information, what we've been able to determine is that unlike glyphosate, where the average concentrations were similar, in this case, we have a situation where Martin County fish, when it's, they're all pooled together, have a significantly higher concentration of mercury in their fillets compared to St. Lucie, Indian River, and Brevard County. Once again, let me point out, we have a much smaller sample size of our mercury in Martin County compared to Brevard, Indian River, and St. Lucie. But at this time, our preliminary data is showing that those Martin County fish have a higher um, presence or concentration of mercury compared to the other counties. When we start comparing those to some of those more established consumption guidelines, what we're seeing is that the orange bar across the bar graph is the EPA's consumption guideline for pregnant women and children. And the gray bar is the EPA or FDA consumption guideline for the general public. And so we see that in the case of the guideline for pregnant women and children, the mercury concentration across all counties exceed that guideline. And the um, only Martin County at this time meets that consumption guideline for the general public. So this is something that we'll continue to monitor and look at, but this is what we're seeing at this point with mercury concentrations in fillet uh, in the various counties. If we tease it apart a little bit further, just as I did with glyphosate, and we look at some different species of fish. So again, these fish have been identified through our fisher surveys as being fish that are commonly consumed. So we have specimen like bluefish, spotted sea trout, red drum, flounder, and so on. Then, and if we compare it to the mercury concentration per serving size, then this is kind of what we're seeing. So a serving size has been determined to be eight ounces. And again, that was based off of our surveys in that we asked people, well, how much of the fish that you catch are you consuming? And we broke it down by portion size and eight ounces seems to be the most common answer. And so again, if we start looking at average mercury concentration per serving size of the various fish, once again, we see that all the species that are listed here exceed that consumption guideline for pregnant women and children, except black drum. And when it comes to the consumption guideline for the general public, only two fish that exceed this at this point are bluefish and spotted sea trout. Um, so as we acquire more data, as we acquire more fish of each specimen, we'll be able to be a bit more confident. I mean, again, I just like to be able to be honest and upfront. Flounder, we have one specimen. So um, that's not something that you're going to be able to lump all flounder in with one specimen. So that's the importance of being able to acquire more of these specific fish so that we can have more confidence in this data. But this is the kind of information that we are really looking to share with the community. And while we don't have consumption guidelines for glyphosate in fish fillet, hopefully our data can be used by those decision makers to be able to start establishing a better understanding of, well, what are we finding in our fish and what is safe and what is not safe? Or how could people be um, affected by consuming those, those organisms and those specimens? Um, the community ask. So that was just kind of some preliminary data that I wanted to show you. Uh, I have other data that I mentioned that I would be happy to um, provide to you if you had any interests, such as microplastics or microcystin. But just for the sake of not overwhelming everyone, I just kind of wanted to give you a little taste of what we um, are finding so far. But I will say that every six months, we provide a findings to date presentation. And so what we do at that time is let all of those individuals who have participated, whether they've donated fish, whether they've come to the lab and processed fish, or they, whether they've helped with extractions, let them know what we're finding with the data and with their help and the direction that we're going into 
uh, as a result of that. And so anyone is welcome to attend one of those findings to date. Um, the next one is sometime in the fall. And so um, you'd be welcome to reach out to me and uh, I could put you on that list, but you're welcome to be a part of that at any time. If I break it down to kind of just the ask, number one is we need fish from Martin County and Volusia County. So again, if you are a fisher or you know someone who is, who is able to um, catch a legal in-season fish from our um, list, then I would love to talk to you further just to kind of give you a quick overview of what you do. Um, so we need to know the date that you caught that fish, the general location of where you caught that fish, and then that whole fish needs to be put on ice or thrown in your freezer until it can be dropped off at one of our partner bait and tackle shops. And so I'm just gonna skip ahead real quickly to show you those spots. So these are some of our partner bait shops that have been gracious enough to be able to accept any of our fish donations. So if you live down in Martin County and you catch a fish, you can put it in a Ziploc bag, put a little card with where you caught it, the date that you caught it, what you think the fish is, put it in your freezer or immediately go drop it off at Snook Nook and they'll hold it for us until we can come down there and pick them up. So these partners have been huge in being able to obtain more of those fish from various counties. Another way that you can get involved in this project is you can um, help us process, meaning dissect again, or homogenize those fish. So we hold um, monthly training workshops where you can come in and learn how to do that and follow our um, standard operating procedures to help us progress the project. But we have freezers and freezers full of fish that um, could use some help in homogenizing and preparing. We've had some people who um, are well connected in the community and, and they want to help us arrange a fishing tournament. And those have been very helpful in getting um, quantities of fish at a one-time shot. And again, so if that is someone who in this audience right now who might be able to help arrange a fishing tournament with those fish being able to go to our project, we would love that. Um, you can help us collect fisher surveys. So so right now, if you want to be a part of this project, you can scan that QR code and you can fill out a Fisher survey. So these surveys, again, help us guide our human health component of our One Health project to better understand um, how much people are consuming, where they're consuming those fish, how, what specimens or species, and so on. Spreading the word. So if you have an interest in this project, you want to know more, tell your friends about it. Tell your local bait and tackle shop that maybe aren't one of our partners. Um, talk to your school. So if you're a teacher and you want your students to get more involved in science research, then this project is a great way for them to do that. We go into classrooms and we'll provide processing workshops. We'll come into classrooms and give presentations on this. So spreading the word is a really great way to get involved in our One Health Fish Monitoring Project. Funding is always an issue or a nonprofit. I know you all know how I feel about that if you work for a nonprofit, but we can't really advance our projects and advance the analytes that we test for without proper funding. And then the other thing is, if you have any questions, if you want to get involved, feel free to reach out to me Anytime, this is my email address. You can check out our website for our calendar of events and register for an upcoming processing workshop if you wanted to. Um, we have tried to do some pop-up events where we go to uh, Snook Nook actually in Martin County and do a processing workshop down there um, to give some of our Southern participants a chance to get more involved. And we've kind of stopped that because we haven't gotten very good participation. But again, if you would like to get involved in that, let us know. So we know we should start that back up. So this is really the community ask of you for this project. And so um, again, I wanna just thank our bait and tackle shops. They are such a huge asset to us. I wanna thank our sponsors. Um, and I also really want to thank Dr. Matthew Scripter, who has provided endless amounts of fish confirmation uh, and identification for me. So I really appreciate that. And those are our references from today's talk.
And with that, I would love to take any questions that you have regarding our One Health Fish Monitoring Citizen Science Project. Great, thank you so much, Missy. Yes. We do have some questions in the chat and we encourage you all to continue to put any questions that you have in the chat. But before we go to the chat, Vincent, do we have any in-person questions? Uh, no, um, no, um, not right now. Okay, great. Um, so the first question, and this is from the beginning of your talk, um, this is, do, can you describe what the upper and lower healthy parameters for the Northern IRL are? So for like salinity, um, chlorophyll A, nutrients, I know it's a that's a big question. I don't think I would be able to be able to provide those specific details without being able to reference something, just to be completely honest. Um, I could probably find that information out for that individual, but I am hesitant to provide any of that verbally. Vincent, do you have anything to add in terms of sort of the healthy parameters for salinity, total nitrogen, chlorophyll A? Oh, for nutrients? No, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't. I don't have that um, off the top of my head um, for those. Sorry. I, I can reference um, some of the work that we do at Orca, though. So we do something called pollution maps, and those are one-time mapping events where we will collect water and sediment samples in different regions of the lagoon. And we have done several of them in Brevard County. And so that is something that can be referenced on our website and it's a visual tool. So it's kind of read like a weather map. And so that, while that won't give you necessarily the averages of those parameters that this individual is looking for, it may provide a little insight in what we have found through our data. Great. Thank you. And I know that the, um, the state's basin management action plans will also have sort of targets for nutrients um, that we can go back and reference for you, Bill. Um, the next question I think you probably addressed already. It was, and Vincent's nodding his head, so I'm going to skip over that one. <laughs> um, you have a volunteer offer for St. Lucie County, so we did put your email address in the chat. So Ian, reach out to Missy and um, become a St. Lucie County volunteer. Yes, love it. <laughs> um, Vincent asks, uh, so specifically for the Martin County samples, um, do you recall which species are represented? Was that for uh, um, glyphosate or? Uh, yeah, no, that was specifically for the mercury. Um, sorry, I should have uh, no, no, no. That's a great question. So I kind of glanced at that this morning, uh, interestingly enough, because we were running some um, additional glyphosate on some newer Martin County si samples. And so it's a mix of hardhead catfish, which we get a ton of, um, creval jacks, mangrove snapper, and there's uh, one mulhara mixed in there. So there might be a spotted sea trout, maybe one, but that's the majority of the species that we have represented right now. I'd be curious to find out, you know, which that average, you know, uh, concentration of mercury, what, what was represented species-wise, you know, which jacks are known to have more mercury than, than maybe. Right, uh, right. As, as, and could that be why Martin County is, concentration is being pulled to make it significant. And I think that all goes back to wanting to be able to acquire enough samples to be sure that it is not one species that might be pulling that mercury concentration up. Um, so we have a more representative uh, sample of species as well as size from Marin County. And the next question is about, is there any possibility of identifying trends for point sources, getting fish probably oh, likely over relying on regular spots versus, you know, regular fishing spots versus sort of having a diversity of locations, yeah. I think so is I, what the I, question is. Uh, okay, so I, I was going to say, like, I, I think if I'm understanding it correctly, what I didn't share, but what we're doing internally as well, is that within each county, we break up the uh, county into different sectors. 
So for example, Indian River County may have 30 different sectors that are making up that county. And so when people donate their fish, we're not only are we denoting it by county, but also specific sector so that we would be able to potentially see whether or not different concentrations of toxins and toxicants are accumulating in different sub sectors of a county. So maybe near a um, drainage canal or um, near a known pollution hotspot. And so that is something that we are also kind of teasing apart as we uh, work through this project. Great, thank you. Um, Jim asks, how many pounds of fish per week need to be eaten to be an impactful health concern? And I think this probably goes back to the recommendations for like the mercury guidance. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's different and it and it goes by different species. So the way that those guidelines are structured right now is that different quantities are suggested or recommended for different species. Yeah. And I just pulled up the EPA guidelines. Um so if it's a, a good choice or a best choice, so a fish that doesn't have, you know, high mercury levels, eat two to three servings of fish per week. Um, children should be two servings, but if it's a high mercury fish, um, check those advisories it, to see if there's a do not eat. Um, and if there is no advisory, eat only one serving and no other fish that week. So that's specific to mercury. I also really think that it's important to mention too that the goal of this project is is really not to be able to tell people don't eat the fish. If anything, we want people to be able to consume the fish and to be able to continue fishing. It's such an important cultural component of our area. It's necessary with subsistence fishers. And so if anything, this data is really meant to be more of a allow people to make informed decisions. And um, we we want to be able to uphold the Clean Water Act. We want people to be able to consume fish. Um, I have a question related to that one, and then I'll go back to the questions in the chat. But is there um, a, a human health guidelines for glyphosate? So I haven't been able to find any. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll, you'll know, they'll create them by state. Um, and so I was trying to tease that apart. There is for water, drinking water, there are guidelines and limits, right? But as far as um, consumption, I haven't been able to find those. Thank you. Yes. Um, Raquel asked, does this project extend to Polk County? No, not yet, but this is certainly a project that can be transferable to other waterways. And so we're actually in conversations about being able to expand into a, um, a tributary or river up in Georgia. And so, nope, it's not at this time, but it certainly could be if there was a demand and, and funding to support. Great, thank you. Um, we do have more questions, but for those of you you who are listening, I did launch the evaluation poll. If you would take five seconds to complete that, that helps Vincent and I sort of determine which presentation topics you all really like so that we can plan for next year. Um, Missy, the next question is from David. And has there been any effort to connect with the local fish houses that buy from local commercial fishermen? There are several in Martin County um, that he does business with and would hope that they would be helpful. Happy yeah, to help be... with getting on board. <laughs> yes, I would love your help. So um, I, I think that's a great avenue and I would love to be able to talk to you further about that. Um, so I'm open. Uh, we're also open to working a little bit more with the charter fishers or those those tour guides who may be catching and releasing or maybe a bycatch, not realizing that it's actually one of those fish on our consumable list. So um, yes, I'm open, open, open. Great, thank you. That is the end of our questions right now. We do have a few more minutes, if you don't mind hanging on just to see if we get any last minute questions. But in the meantime, thank you, Missy, for a fantastic presentation. Um, thank you all for joining us um, in the summertime. We know that schedules tend to get a little crazy. So we really appreciate your commitment to this program. And we look forward to seeing you all in August. Oh, more questions. Okay. Do you have any fish processing places in Brevard County? Okay, great question. So we also have... Um... 
a, a pop-up site. We've been fortunate enough to be able to use one of the satellite offices from the DEP in Titusville. So it's kind of similar to what I mentioned about Martin County, where we weren't really getting regular uh, interest. But if you live in Brevard County and you are interested, then shoot me an email so that I can, if we need to restart it, we will, because I'd love to be able to give you the opportunity. Great. And hey. Marina has a great presentation. Um, she asked where you can access the recording. And I just put the YouTube link. Um, so this and all of our past uh water ambassador webinars from i think like 2021 to this current one will be posted on that youtube page so we have a little bit of um we have a few in every year since we started doing webinars uh start going back to 2020 but we're up to date for 2023 and i've got one more to upload for 2022 and so i'm just working my way backward <laughs> Steve asks, um, why is Volusia County not participating? The Mosquito Lagoon is very important. I agree. Um, I think it's I think it's distance. Uh, we're quite a ways away. And I think just because our lack of presence in Volusia County. But um, luckily, the Marine Discovery Center has agreed to sign on as one of the uh, acceptance people who will acquire fish and hold them for us. And so um, through their help of kind of spreading the word and their willingness to hold the fish, I do, uh, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to expand that. But I agree with you. It's a very important region of the lagoon. And, and Missy, I'd, I'd like to extend an invitation for you for a processing workshop um, at uh, Martin County Extension. And maybe oh, that will help generate interest. We'll have to work out, you know, when, but I, I think yeah. it'd be great to have a training at our extension office in, uh, here in Stewart. I would love that. Thank you. That would be huge. Okay. Well, we have lots of thanks and lots of great presentations, but I think that is the end of our question. So thank you again, Missy, and thank you all. Oh, wait, no, nope, there's more. We're still going. <laughs> um, you will have an email, but do you have a list of public fishing spots in Martin County so people know where to access? I don't have that. Um, I've really been dependent on those people who have kind of regularly fished Martin County to continue doing that. Um, my understanding is that it really can be from anywhere, uh, land-based or boat-based, as long as it's in the Indian River Lagoon or one of those freshwater connecting waterways. Not so the I Atlantic have a question. Ocean. Yeah, oh, Vincent, do you want to comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, Ian, um, go ahead and send me an email and I can I can point you to a few, few locations. There's quite a lot. Um, so regarding this question that, that Ian has, it's, in, and you were just, I think you were right in the middle of, of answering that, Missy. They can fish anywhere, right? Anywhere that's in the Indian River Lagoon, whether they're from a boat or. Absolutely, uh, okay. absolutely. Land-based, boat-based. The only requirement is that it's not on the ocean. So it's gotta be in the lagoon in the or lagoon. freshwater. Okay. Yeah, Ian, yeah. send me an email. I'll, I'll point you to a few different locations. Yeah, Lake Okeechobee works too, St. Lucie Estuary, all of that. Okay. I'm going to put my Sea Grant hat on and just make sure that if you're harvesting fish, it does meet the um, state regulations for catch absolutely. size. And <laughs> Legal yeah, absolutely. Legal and in season. Yes. <laughs> um, so the Loxahatchee River, just north of Jupiter Inlet, would be okay, even though it crosses into Palm Beach County? Question? Well, yeah. I think we yeah. would take it. Okay, yep, it's on the Martin County line. So we're giving a thumbs up, David. Great, well, the questions keep coming in. So um, for those of you who need to leave, thank you so much. And um, Missy, if you don't mind hanging on for another couple minutes, we'll see if there's a couple more questions. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Yes, thanks everybody for coming and uh, see you at the next one.
We'll give it one more minute, Missy, and then we'll no let problem. you go. <laughs> Sorry, it was a little short. I didn't realize it was. No, it was fantastic. It's perfect. It's nice to have a, a lengthy amount of time for the Q and A. It's it's. I think it's great. Yeah, and just because we allow an hour doesn't mean that we have to hit. Right. Right. Okay, well, I think that's probably it for the questions. Thanks so much. Ooh, and I've been okay. recording this the whole time. So Vincent, you're gonna need to trim that a little. <laughs> okay.